Welcome to the Evolving Spiritual Practice Podcast. My name is Ralph Cree. This is brought to you in association with bodyheartmindspirit.co.uk. Today I spoke with Mary Finnegan and Rob Hogendorn, who have written uh, an amazing book called Sex and Violence in Tibetan Buddhism, The Rise and Fall of Sogyal Rinpoche. Um, we explored, well, that topic uh, Sogya Rinpoche, who uh, we actually don't in this conversation call Rinpoche because Rinpoche is a, a, a um, Tibetan word which is uh, very respectful for someone. And um, Sogya uh, Lakar, as his family name, was um, uh, he died in 2019, uh, but taught uh, Tibetan Buddhism and, uh, for 45 years or so, created this enormous um uh, organization called rigpa which is in uh, got centers all across the world um <clears throat> and uh he managed to do all of this for 45 years uh whilst abusing uh lots of people sexually um with with power with money um and just managed to get away with it for all this time um and uh so they've written this very detailed book all about uh, the problems of him and his organization. But we also touch on the wider theme of gurus and spiritual teachers behaving unethically, whether they are Indian, Tibetan, Japanese, shamans, um, American gurus, European gurus, you know, anybody. And um, we uh, try to um, outline some of the ways you can spot uh, the red flags, things to look out for, and also some positive qualities. You know, what are the things that you should look for in a spiritual community and a spiritual teacher? Um, so I'll just uh, say a couple of things um, about Mary and Rob uh, from their the little bio they have at the beginning of their book. Uh, so Mary Finnegan was born in Manchester, England, just before the start of World War II. Marrying an older man at 18, she produced two children before moving to London and landing a job as a fashion writer on the Daily Mirror. Her print journalism career included featuring writing at the Daily Sketch, Daily Express and freelance at the Sunday Times and The Guardian. During a five year holiday from a five day week in 1969, she met the legendary rock star David Bowie, who introduced her to Tibetan Buddhism. Their devotion to this comprehensive spiritual path has remained steadfast ever since. Returning to her journalism career, Mary worked as a reporter, editor and producer at Viz News, Independent Radio News and the London Broadcasting Company. Mary met Sogyo Lakar, aka Rinpoche, in 1973, helping him to set himself up as a lama before becoming sceptical about his credentials. With her journalistic training running in tandem with her appreciation for Tibetan Buddhism, she embarked on a campaign to match contemporary ethical values with the fundamentals of Buddhist view and practice. Mary and her co-author <clears throat> Rob Hogendorn pooled their skills and resources after meeting on social media. Mary lives in Devon, England with her partner Chris Gilchrist. And Rob <clears throat> Hogendorn studied law at the Erasmus University at Rotterdam, Netherlands. After graduating as a Master of Law, he worked as a co-ordinator for the Center for Applied Ethics at its Faculty of Philosophy, co-editing two books on environmental philosophy. In 1993 to 1994, he spent a year among Tibetan communities in India, researching law from a Tibetan Buddhist perspective. After that, he focused his research on the 14th Dalai Lama's conversations with mostly Western scientists. To this end, he attended several mind and life conferences and summer schools and taught about mind and life during a science for monks worship, um, <clears throat> during a science for monks worship at Sera Monastery in India. For the past six years, he's researched and published on sexual abuse by Buddhist teachers, both as an investigative reporter and an unaffiliated scholar. 
The last two years, he's focused on researching the formative years of Sogyo Lakar, formerly known as Sogyo Rinpoche. He presented a paper on his findings during the 2018 meeting of the American Academy of Religion in Denver, Colorado. Rob is married with three children. He lives in Marcelin near Rotterdam in the Netherlands. So that's just a little bit about Mary and Rob. Um, this is a very in-depth conversation uh, on a very, very important topic. If you are in spirituality, you're involved with spiritual organizations, um, this is how we can make uh, this whole um, world of spiritual communities, spiritual teachers, practitioners, uh, a more wholesome, healthy, truer place that's more uh, good, true and beautiful. So uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation. Mary Finnegan and Rob Hogendorn, uh, welcome to the Evolving Spiritual Practice podcast. It's a pleasure nice to, to be to, with you. Hello. Yeah, thank you. Nice, nice to meet you both. And um, so the topic of our conversation today is something that, so my, my podcast is all about um, spiritual practice, you know, in, in different forms and different traditions. Something that I have touched on uh, briefly in a lot of podcasts is um, you know, the sort of difficult question around gurus and, um, you know, unethical gurus and also unethical organizations and how to spot ones that look dodgy and how to spot ones that look sound. And you've written this amazing book called um, Sex and Violence in Tibetan Buddhism, The Rise and Fall of Sogyal Rinpoche, um, which we're, we're going to be talking about today and just to sort of set the context for people listening to this um so Sogya Rinpoche um and I think we we might agree at the beginning that we perhaps we don't call him Rinpoche because Rinpoche is a, a, a Tibetan word of it's, it's sort of highest respect for a, a teacher in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition um and um so we might refer to him as Sogyo, <laughs> it's just his, his, his first name. I mean, his family name was Lakar, but um, so Sogyo Lakar. Um, but he was probably the, you know, just behind the Dalai Lama in terms of popularity, sort of second most famous Tibetan Buddhist in the world. Um, and taught for about 30 years, uh, he created this enormous multinational uh, organization that has called RIGPA that has centers in 21 countries um, and somehow and that's you know how we're going to what we're going to explore somehow managed despite lawsuits and newspaper articles and um, you know all sorts of um, information getting out about how bad his behavior was somehow managed to keep going for about 30 years you know without a, a stop being made right up until the his death which was in 2017 is that right it was if i could interrupt you mm. there um it was eight signatory letter that blew him out of the water when eight of his most senior students wrote a letter outlining their absolute shock, horror, and disgust at the things that he did. And they outlined this in some detail, um, all of which is recorded in the book. Yeah. Yeah, and he, he died in um, August 2019. Ah, 2019, yeah. So, I mean, the, um, your book is very detailed and... Um, you know, we're, we're only going to be able to scratch the surface of it. And I, I really recommend people read this book as a kind of, you know, blueprint for, to, to, to learn, you know, because, uh, well, we, we'll, we'll get into all of that stuff, but your book's absolutely fantastic. I really recommend people read it. But I, this, so just to, just to finish off the context of this conversation, this is a very broad problem. It's not specific to Tibetan Buddhism. Um, we've had Indian teachers, uh, Japanese Zen teachers, endless uh, Christian priests and uh, American gurus and European gurus. Um, you know, uh, loads and loads of examples of it. It's a very big thing. And I was hoping 
one thing we could do uh, during the course of this conversation to help people who are listening to this is to highlight s some of the warning signs um, around teachers and also their organizations that people so to help people spot the kind of red flags and also the opposite so what, what are some of the positive things what are the some of the green lights that people might notice that are kind of like you know positive attributes of teachers and organizations so to help people either at the beginning of their journey or people who might be in deep in an organization and, and just be starting to question it um, so that's the, my kind of broad outlining of the topic. Um, and I mean, is there anything else, anything you'd like to add on top of that at this point? I think that's quite a satisfactory way of um, framing it. And, and um, I think it's also very important that this information gets out as much as possible, as often as possible by people who really are in a position to comment with authority yeah yeah and i i would stress that we we did a, a very in-depth investigation into uh, sogiel's uh, past uh, and uncovered many things that were not widely known um and as you say there are many more cases like it uh, so i would encourage people to to actually investigate um, other cases too, not just this one, because once you see different cases, you start to distinguish the patterns that they have in common. Um, and that's very helpful, I think, to, to basically educate yourself about uh, the warning signs and so on. Yeah. And yeah, so this is a specific example we're concentrating on, but it, you know, this is a template that applies, you know, uh, in a wider context. So I just wanted to start in reading from your forward. There's a little paragraph which I think helps sort of, uh, highlight um, our orientation in in wanting to to, dis to discuss this. So I'm just quoting from your forward. You say, "We tell the story because we care deeply about Tibetan Buddhism." We hope that by highlighting some of the things that have gone wrong during the early stages of its transition into the developed world, the Lamas from Tibet and their students will be able to move towards appreciating each other on equal terms. The Lamas and their followers both have a lot to learn about how to cope with the cultural dissonance that could not be avoided when feudal medieval old Tibet met modern Western liberal democracy. Um, so that's something I talk quite a bit on on my podcast is about different worldviews and sort of culture wars and how they clash. And I think that is a very that's a very important point that you raise that um, up until quite late, you know, in, in history, the Tibetan monastic culture was built around this feudal system, which we haven't seen in the West for. Um, you know, perhaps a thousand years or something. And, you know, this is a sort of pre-modern worldview meeting modernity and post-modernity. Um, and there's been a lot of friction and, the, the, you know, that the clash of those two worlds has, has been responsible for that, that friction. Yeah. Um, well, I, th I think that um, the Tibetans are an extreme example because um, despite the fact that lots and lots and lots of people, not just Rob and I, but many other people have realized that um, what they brought with them from Tibet was an extraordinarily archaic um, attitude, social attitudes, attitudes towards women and attitudes towards sex. And... I think that because they were so extreme, we expected more of them because we also admired them hugely. You know, they carried a tradition and a, 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 a methodology with them that was absolutely extraordinarily effective and useful. But their social attitudes were sort of stuck somewhere in the 1100s. And, um, the thing that pains me most is that they haven't really changed that much. 
They're much the same now in those social attitudes as they were when all this stuff started to come to light. Ron, yeah. I'm sure you've got something um, to say about that. Yeah, the uh, thing that I often say is that the uh, reception of Buddhism in the West by and large has been a-critical, uh, which I think is not even a reception of Buddhism, but a reception of Western ideas about Buddhism and prejudices about Buddhism. And this a-critical attitude um, has made it very easy for uh, lamas uh, and, and charlatans to basically do as they please without anyone checking anything ever. Um, and it's a bit schizophrenic because when you get to know uh, Western Buddhists, one of the sentences that you often hear first is that Buddhists don't take anything on faith. They only accept things that they have investigated and checked and, you know, uh, but hardly anyone does that. So there's a false sense of security of Buddhists being so critical uh, and they're not which made it very easy for for abuses to continue for decades yeah that's a really that's a really really important point and i um you know i was a case in point i got into tibetan buddhism when i was 18 and i immediately recognized how advanced it was it was the sort of uh the most comprehensive exploration of consciousness i'd ever come across in my life and you know far exceeded anything i'd ever seen in christianity um at that time and i've i've subsequently learned more about christian mysticism and there's there's a lot of uh, richness and depth there as well um, but there's as mary was saying that there's something particular particularly um well particularly comprehensive comprehensive about, yeah, about the t Tibetan yeah. uh, Tibetan Buddhist um, t well teachings. It's 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 so it's so vast. It's so comprehensive. It's so detailed. It's so scientific in a way um, that it, it's incredibly impressive. And I I was bowled over by it when I first encountered it. And as a result, uh, going referring back to what Rob was saying, uh, at the age of 18, 19, I. Uh, my my critical thinking went out of the window. I was just completely infatuated by this exotic, incredible teachings uh, that I still very much admire. Um, and I thought, I literally thought all Tibetans were enlightened. So, you know, I went to different monasteries and, and places and I saw, you know, Tibetans. And I think, you know, uh, an enormous amount of Tibetans are monks too. You know, uh, a huge proportion of the population amongst. But you know, when I so I was just seeing normal Tibetans, and I would just at that impressionable age think, these this person's probably enlightened. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> oh, do you know yeah. what I mean? And yeah, yeah, sure. But you know, Tibetans, of course, know that many Westerners think like this. Uh, which it makes it very easy to exploit their gullibil gullibility, and and they do. Yeah, but not all of them. I mean, not all of them. No, but you know, the, too many Ralph of them. Was, yeah, Ralph was saying that there are some very honourable people teaching to sure. Tibetan Buddhism, both yeah. Tibetan and Inji. Yeah, sure. Foreigners. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're, um, we're absolutely. I, I don't want to. I don't want to give uh, anyone listening to this the impression that, that we're, we're tarring all Tibetan Buddhism with the same brush, all Tibetans, all Tibetan teachers. And um, uh, I understand, Mary, you're a long time practitioner of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and uh, Rob, I'm not I, I don't know much about your practice. Well, yeah. I, I, I call myself a Buddhist, um, yeah. perhaps a reluctant Buddhist, yeah. um, and I became um, a Buddhist more than 25 years ago oh. in the usual way. Um, I ended, I, I spent time in India among Tibetans, ended up in the Tibetan Buddhist center. Uh, and after a while I, I took refuge there. So I, you know, I, I officially became a Buddhist there. Um, and um, people have asked me many times whether or not uh, it's hard for me as a Buddhist to be 
investigating uh, abuse and, and, you know, all kinds of um, shadow sides. Uh, but I actually think that's a Buddhist practice because to me, uh, Buddhism is about cultivating a sense of reality and the shitty parts are part of reality, you know? And um, uh, so I, I see no problem in, in dealing with those shadow sides. Um, and, you know, Tibetans, being who they are and having their backgrounds and all of that uh, and Westerners being who they are with their backgrounds and worldview, it's just very important that the interactions between them are critical, you know, uh, and uh, as the Dalai Lama can be critical about Western culture or, or science or philosophy, so we can be critical of you know, Tibetan Buddhist uh, views or practices. So, um, and, and when things go off the rails, when the critical element is lacking, I think. Yeah. Yeah, the adulation and the mystique and the Shangri-La factor played into all of this in the early days. And I have had, been excoriated by, um, as it were, um, party faithful, you know, true believers, I think is the word that Rob uses, um, because of the fact that many times in, within the context of the group that I belonged to until very recently, um, I have raised a critical voice and I have said, for example, why has Chögyal Namkai Nobu agreed to meet up with Sogyal to endorse him and to go and visit his center and to have him come to Merigal, which is Namkai Nobu's center, and has jollied along and been photographed with him when Namkai Nobu knows full well that Sogyal is a complete charlatan who was never trained as a lama and has abused countless people and caused misery for decades. And he knew that. Lots of people told him, not just me. Yeah. So that solidarity has something, I think, to do with them being an exile community and under very considerable duress. I mean, their survival is on an edge, I think particularly in view of the sort of recent political seismic shift that's taken place since Narendra Modi hit the scene, uh, Hindu nationalism, and they're already persecuting Muslims. Are they going to turn on the Tibetans next? Doesn't seem unlikely somehow. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a very, very important point to raise, that you know, groups of people, when under threat, you know, there's a survival strategy. You've got to keep tight. Um, and yeah. again, you know, that's understandable. Um, but as Rob's saying, you you can still be critical of that at the same time. It's that, you know, people don't tend to like to hold two things in their mind at once. You know, and this is an example of, <laughs> uh, you, you know what I mean? That, that yeah. there, there are genuine reasons why uh, the Tibetan um, culture and people need to form this, this, this tightness. But at the same time, we can still criticize it without saying, uh, you know, or you're not pretending that they're not under threat, you know, it's, um, yeah. But it might be good for us to explore some more of the specifics of the situation with Rigpa and Sogyo, just so people have got some more ideas of what we're talking about, because it's, it's a little bit abstract at the moment. And um, just so people can actually see that he actually is a genuine charlatan, <laughs> was a charlatan. Well, let me start by saying that uh, Sogyo grew up in a very remote area of Tibet, um, a, the province of Kham. And actually the place where he lived was in Chinese territory at the time. So they were making the best of uh, living in a, an, an occupied part of Tibet. Um, and um, uh, very soon, it turned out that the family was without male, uh, without males. Uh, so uh, his his uh, uh, grandfather died. The brother of his grandfather died. Um, his father disappeared somehow. So the the family was in trouble. 
because they were a trader's family. They really needed males to continue their work, but they weren't there. So they sought out the support of a local Lama who was uh, familiar with the family and they made donations to his monastery. Uh, and this Lama married Sogyal's aunt, so the sister of his mother. Um, and Sogyal has made a, a big story out of this as if he was, was accepted as a, at a very early age, at, as early as uh, six months uh, old, uh, as a tulku who was then being trained in the monastery. But uh, this is not borne out by the facts. Um, so it's clear that he spent some time in that monastery, but nowhere enough time to receive a proper training. Uh, he was born in um, 1947, and they left that monastery uh, in, in the course of 1954. So when he was seven years old, then it took a long time for them to travel overland to uh, the capital of Tibet, Lhasa, and then onwards to uh, Sikkim, which was then uh, an independent uh, protectorate of uh, Great Britain. Um, now, during those years, he couldn't have had any training at all. Uh, and then pretty soon after he arrived in uh, Sikkim, um, uh, his parents decided to send him to uh, a boarding school, uh, which was a Catholic school. And he has uh, shared anecdotes about his time there. Uh, so he was raised as a proper Catholic by the teachers and the friars of that school. Uh, and he actually went to mass on Sundays and stuff like that. Um, and then at the end of that time, he uh, has said he taught at that school for a short while. Um, he went on to, um, to New Delhi to, to college. Um, and that was an Anglican college. So again, not Buddhist, not, not you know, a Christian a college run by uh, Anglicans. Uh, and from there he went to England, um, which is where Mary can pick up the story. Now, if you look at the timeline, you know, many of the facts are known and well corroborated. There never was a period in which he could have been educated uh, as a, not even as a monk, never mind, you know, uh, a, a, a well trained Lama. Um, so, uh, and he didn't think of himself as a Lama. No one saw him as a Lama. He basically invented being a Lama after he came to England and discovered that people were seeing him as a Lama. Yeah, that's pretty much how it was. I mean, I came across Sogel via a friend, the late Zina Rachevsky who was a very early convert to Tibetan Buddhism and a nun. And she wrote to me and said, there's a very nice young Nyingma Lama living in Cambridge, um, who is accompanying the, um, a prince of Sikkim. What, what year was this? Sorry. She told me, um, this would have been 1973, I think. Yes, roughly. Yeah. And um, so I um, made contact with him and went to Cambridge and met him. And we spent a very pleasant afternoon sitting in the sunshine in a nice garden. And he gave me a little book, which was a teaching um, from his alleged guru, Dujom and Pache, who was very highly respected. And actually, Sogyal didn't spend that much time with Dujong ever, even when he was in India, because they were Kalimpong, Sikkim, and then Darjeeling, places like that. There's an awful lot of geography between them, and yeah. they were all in different places. And I don't think they ever really got together. Um, and um, so I went away, went back to London, carried on with my life. I was a working journalist at the time, and I was also living in a squat in Kentish town. And um, it was quite a posh squat. 
And um, about a couple of months later, I got a phone call from Sargell saying that he was wanting to start a Buddhist centre in London. And would I help him? And so I agreed to help him. And I'd already been fairly well inducted into Tibetan Buddhism well, and having spent six months in India. So I knew what I was taking myself in for. Um, and um, so his first, he was teaching, he was actually setting himself up as a Lama. And at that stage, I didn't know any of the background that Rob has just told us about. I assumed that he was trained and that he was the real deal. Um, but I think within a matter of months of him setting himself up in London with help from me and a very small group of people, um, we all began to realize that he was a little bit of a wide boy and that he really was busking it. And um, this particularly came to light for me um, because I had a boyfriend at the time called John Driver, who was a very, very highly respected Tibetologist, um, spoke fluent Tibetan, um, both classical and colloquial, knew Sanskrit inside out and Pali. And um, he had also done a lot of practice with um, various Nyingma Lamas. And um, we went to a teaching by Dujon Rinpoche together. And while we were sitting there listening, um, Sogal was translating, yeah. And because I think that was probably the role that he mostly had when he first came to London, it was just translating for the big boys because as soon as he set up a center in London, all the other Lamas came over, yeah. He was like the sort of messenger, the pioneer, if you like. Um, and anyway, John and I were sitting next to each other and John was following the text with a Tibetan book, you know, the pages that turn over. And he was really normally a very well-mannered English gent, yeah. And he was frowning and making all sorts of like naughty noises, um, you know, looking thoroughly uncomfortable. And in the lunch break, he dragged me off to a cafe and he said, this is absolutely ridiculous because Sogar is not translating properly. Either he doesn't understand what Rinpoche is saying or he's sanitizing it so that he, you know, is, as it were, making it um, palatable for Western students. He was dumbing it down a lot. Yeah. yeah. And that is related to, um, well, things really took off i mean we're, we're we're skipping a lot and we can come back to what, what i've skipped over but things really really exploded for him with the publication of this book the tibetan book of living and dying um which um you know i understand from reading your book there are suspicions that he actually had hardly anything to do with the writing of it um nothing at all to do no. with the writing of it but he did have something to do with the content yeah I mean, I think, you know, he, he advised quite a lot, but other people did the research, Patrick Gaffney, notably. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, and you, sorry, Rob. Well, as far as the content of the book is concerned, Sogio's contributions are by and large anecdotes, which are very common stories that most Tibetans will be able to share with you. Uh, and then some Buddhist views, but most of those are very trivial. And, you know, any, any monk or, or teacher could, would be able to share those with you. Um, so he is more or less a storyteller. And he had this very charming way about him, you know, and, and that's something that he had practiced for, for quite some time uh, by the time the book was finished. Uh, so he was a very experienced storyteller and he knew what worked and what didn't work. Um, and to this day, the book is appreciated for that reason. You know, people like the stories, like the anecdotes, um, but they are not original, not his, 
he's just, you know, sharing folklore. Uh, it's not very special, actually. Um, the special thing about it is um, the writing. The, uh, Andrew Harvey's absolutely yeah. brilliant. Uh, and that's, really yeah, but that's not so else. No, no. Yeah. I mean, Andrew Harvey wrote that book. Yeah. And he really did. Yeah, and I, I mean, know I'm, I'm quite familiar with Andrew. I'm quite familiar with Andrew Harvey nowadays. And, uh, you know, I, I very, very much respect him as a mystic and a writer, a poet. Yeah. You know, he's, yeah. he's, he's the real deal. And the, yeah. so I, when I read the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying when I was 18 in 1990, um, 1996, um, I was blown away by it. And um, you know, I thought it was an amazing book. And I think, I mean, it's been a long, it's, I haven't read it for, for 20 years or something. Uh, I, I read it, I read it twice. I read it, you know, once to, at the beginning. And then a, a few years later, I read it again and thought, yeah, this is, this is a really good book. You know, so it's been a long since I, since I read it, but I, I, you know, I think it is, it does have some merit as a book. Um, oh, yeah. And, and yeah, so but that, no, no one is, yeah. Well, no, and it, no one is disputing that. Yeah. So it, no, you know, we're it, not disputing it. No. no so it, it's mm. it's 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 a book. Um, you know, it's a it's a good book on Tibetan Buddhism. Um, it's been extremely successful. I mean, it's sold millions of copies. Um, uh, lots and lots of languages translated. So you know, I read that book, was blown away by it, and then um, I went to see. Uh, Sogyal um, teaching at the Rigpa Centre in London on Caledonia Road in about 1999 and I was really excited I thought okay this is great you know this guy wrote this amazing book I went to the centre and nothing it didn't start it was very late to start uh, you know everyone was all there ready yeah. and you know I think this, yeah so this is this was typical it was very late and he just sort of walked in with a video cassette tape and said, oh, <laughs> you, you've come to see uh, me deliver my best teaching. Well, on this video cassette is my best teaching. So I'm going to put this on um, and I'll come back in half an hour. So he, 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 st he sticks his video on and then goes off out the back. We all sit there watching this video of him teaching. And then he comes back out at the end for about a you know, it was a long time ago, but it's it was a very short time. Uh, d delivered a little bit of teaching um, and that was it. And then it was all over. And, and it, the teaching he actually gave in person was quite, uh, you know, it, it didn't strike me as very impressive. And um, yeah. yeah, so I, that was my, you know, the, the time I've actually been to, to see him. And, I, and after that, I thought, I, I'm just not really going to pursue this. So, anymore there, there, there i well, got i got into uh, other tibetan teachers and in all of their you know all of their work um but that that was my experience well, uh, of, of him well good for you uh you know uh, i'm glad that you uh, dropped out right after um thing few people realize is that when you're a, a charlatan and you really have little to teach a basic problem is how do you fill those hours that people are sitting there looking up to you expectantly because you know teaching for five minutes can feel like an awful lot of time never mind two or three hours so i think most much of the theater and the video stuff and you know um is just him filling up time you know, uh, and I, I, I've been amazed that people found it so hard to see through that um, because it's quite clear why he, why he did all that. Um, but you he learned a few tricks there, Rob. He really learned how to entertain. Sure, sure. He but you know how to give yeah, people a yeah, really big yeah, buzz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's all fairground stuff. I mean, it's. Yeah. Absolutely evangelical, tried and tested methods yeah. for giving people a nice buzz. Yeah, you but it, it, it's it's a yeah. Yeah. it's it's a circus. It's carnival. Yeah, it's theater, it's and it amuses 
amuses people endlessly, but it has nothing to do with Buddhism. Yeah. No. And, and he was promoting it as giving them insight into the nature of mind. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and and just, so regrettably, true. regrettably, he wasn't only just a charlatan um, pretending to be a teacher <laughs> when he wasn't. Um, he actually perpetrated some really horrendous abuse um, that, that's all de oh, yeah. detailed in great detail in your book. But the usual cluster of three, it's uh, sex, power and money. Um, yeah. And um, some, I mean, a, a lot of it was legitimately criminal behavior. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, in, in terms of um i mean obviously the 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 the, the sexual um abuse is quite it, that's quite clearly um illegal but um there were financial um there was financial abuse abuse of donations so people were donating large sums of money thinking that it was contributing to the um promotion of tibetan buddhism and you know this uh, organization rigpa and it, those those funds ended up being squandered on um uh, i mean off the top of my head i mean you, you'll be able to give me some facts but some of his own personal um yeah, you know, li living red uh, meat. yeah. and um <laughs> and then Scars. There, there's also you know on the sort of power side um lots of emotional abuse of people but also um, some some very severe physical abuse, even hitting people so hard uh, that I, I believe they, uh, one person at least was knocked unconscious by him, as you yeah. uh, remember. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't want to go uh, too much getting into the weeds of, of the details of the of this abuse because people can read your book and it's all in there. But perhaps we could just just touch on those sort of three categories of, of, of abuse that were perpetrated by him, but not only Sogyal himself, but also some of his inner circle. I mean, and this is a pattern that repeats itself in other organizations. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. So it's, um, it, yeah. So perhaps, you know, right. if, if you don't mind, we could just explore that a little. Well, I think yeah, it's well, as far as sex is concerned, he had a harem. Um, and um, I spent very considerable amount of time with an ex-member of his harem, um, a, a half Japanese, half French girl called Mimi Duhon, um, who um, recorded her experiences for me, which are quoted extensively in the book. Um, the things that happened to the, these girls were, I mean, was just horrendous. I mean, they were routinely beaten almost every day. And his favorite um, weapon was a back scratcher, one of those twangy ones. It, it's yeah. a really and obscene big, weapon. I, yeah. Really hurt. Yeah. Um, people were black and blue. Um, they were starved. They were worked 18 hours a day. They were sleep deprived. Um, they were treated basically like slaves and they were, and they had to be available for all his horrible, um, ghastly sexual activity. Um, and they all had um, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, you could just go on and on. It was absolutely, totally grotesque. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to recognize that all of those abuses are symptoms of uh, a form of power that is absolute, but also the mode of operation was cultivating an all, a near perfect arbitrariness. So you could do everything well and still be blamed. You could be his favorite, but the next moment you, you were his worst enemy. Uh, and that's a very effective means of control. So the level of control that he had over people was extreme. Um, now, of course, these people were all adults and they gave him that power and they gave him that level of control. But once it's in place, it's very hard for any one individual 
to escape from all that. People who couldn't take it anymore left and no one bothered to go after them and ask why they left. So you had a, a self-selective system of people who could take that level of power, that level of control. Uh, but of course, that went from bad to worse. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that Sogial did this from the early 1970s right up until his death. You know, uh, it's not people make much of the teachings that he received later from some well-known teachers. And they say, well, yeah, you know, maybe he didn't know so much when he began, but then he had this teacher and that teacher. But he abused people before that during that time and after that time. Um, so it's a continuous um, uh, lineage of abuse that he established. And also people started copying his behavior. So students were basically not just enabling him, but they were enabling each other in abusive behavior as well. That, that um, is... Uh, so I was wrong. It's not 30 years. We're, we're almost it's it's, you know, we're talking about 45 years or something. He was actually yeah. operating. Oh, I mean, it got progressively worse. I mean, in the early days, he certainly wasn't hitting people. Yeah. I mean, I left when Chogil Namkai and Orbe first talked in 1979 in London. And I realized instantly that he was the real deal. Yeah, and that he yeah. absolutely not Sogal to a top hat. Yeah. And so did most of the original people around Sogal. We all left in a group um, once yeah. we'd heard Norbu. Um, and, but the people who stayed on, I think would say that really the, 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 the physical abuse, I mean, the sexual, the, the promiscuity was there from the get go. I mean, but in those days, women would queue up to shag a rinpoche. You know, it was almost at the same sort of level of prestige as plaster casting Mick Jagger. Um, Mick, you know, bedding a Rinpoche was like, wow, you know, yeah. I've done it. Wow, status. And, and, and then so, there is. You know, hardly surprising that lots and lots of Rinpoches took advantage of that. Yeah, and, yeah. and to, make, to make the sort of sexual situation more complicated, um, you know, there is this tradition that probably has been blown up more than it actually is is a thing um that there is some sort of special spiritual transmission that that happens through having sex um yeah. with a teacher and it's a bit like um the the, the when people talk about tantra they, they always think you're talking about sex now, you know, the tantric sex, but you know, my understanding of the sort of classical Indian Tantra and the actual roots of, 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 um, of Tantra is that th there's, a, there's a relatively small amount of teachings and texts on sexual practice in Tantra. And about 95% of it or, or more, 99% of it is, is about meditation techniques. But, you know, the, the sort of the history has distorted it so that we think it's 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 a sort of when you say tantra, people think of sex, and I don't. But you know, perhaps you can you can uh, unpack this for for myself and people listening to this. That you know, there is this thing where of having it's, it, empowerment through having sex with a teacher, but is it is it similar to the the Indian tantra that's actually traditionally in the Tibetan? original context quite a small part of the whole thing but it seems to have been blown up well, into something yeah i i would approach it the other way around um uh there are only so many excuses and justifications that you can make up for abuse abusive behavior um and people tend to use the same excuses and justifications everywhere across religions, across cultures, across ethnicities. So you will find the excuse of sex being a certain transmission in Orthodox Jewish circles, you know, some rabbi in Israel doing that and making up that as excuse, which is very similar to the one that the Tibetans use or, or still other spiritual teachers use. The same with 
there is a special kind of wisdom which looks crazy to those who don't have it. You will find that across the board in many cultures, religions, ethnicities, communities, etc. So um, to use Tantra in this particular way is just um, making your excuse, give it um, a tribal flavor almost, you know? It has really very little to do with the actual doctrines and teachings of Tantra. Um, so um, again, it's a matter of common sense. When, you know, when behavior like this occurs, people will need excuses to rationalize it, you know? And they'll use anything to, to that serves as an excuse. Um, now, you know, the crazy wisdom, much has been made about of, of crazy wisdom, but if you look at, you know, the work of people who have studied crazy wisdom uh, in depth, um, it started out as a form of fundamentalism. The crazy wisdom adepts were those people who took the tantric teachings literally and acted them out. So if a tantric text said, cover yourself in in entrails of of animals and you know uh, and drink alcohol that's what they were doing which of which of course didn't conform to the norms of their time so they were thought of as crazy um but that's very very different from you know hitting people and telling them that this is the way to transmit your wisdom to them and that's a form of tantric practice so we're, we're a long way from actual Tantra, uh, you know, when, when you look at uh, the excuses that uh, Sovio made up. Yeah, but I mean, Tantra, the actual sexual union, say Guru Rinpoche, Pambasambhava, and Yeshua, or yes. Mandarava, I mean, that is what is known as the completion stage yeah. in Vajrayana, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it is actually perfectly true that they say that there's no Mahamudra without Karma Mudra. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to go the distance, then you have to do the sexual practices. But they involve so much heavy duty yoga in order to be able to do them. Yeah. You've got to go into a cave and practice for like 10 years before you can. Yeah in the right position and hold your breath properly and yeah. do all of yeah. those things. It's yeah. incredibly challenging and very yeah. demanding. Yeah. And there was an exhibition recently in London of the Dalai Lama's um, temple in uh, at the Norbury Linka. I can't remember what it's called now off the top of my head. Um, where there were all these wonderful pictures of yogis doing various forms of yatra yoga, which were like really heavy duty yoga serious yeah. serious stuff in order to reach the stage where they could actually practice yabyam and yeah. practicing yabyam involved withholding yeah never ever having an orgasm yeah. but having states of bliss which transcended into a state of deep profound realization and insight yeah yeah yeah. Now, tell me that's easy. Tell me you can do that in five minutes when you're seducing a bimbo. I mean, come on. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, Sovio using Tantra as an excuse is like Sovio watching sports program on TV and making you believe that he is a professional athlete because of that. Yes. You know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. So one of the questions and this you know we rob touched on it earlier that within tibetan buddhism you've got these kind of four main sects um you you've got uh, ningma gelug and um kagyu and um or it's just not Sakya. 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 and you know they all debate amongst each other about who's got the right approach and things and or thought the or you know they have their own authority figures within their own sects and things and the Dalai Lama is the head of the Gelug um, sect. So no, he's not. No, he, no, no, oh, no. Sorry, he no, isn't. he's not. No, sorry, um, it's been. No, my, my he, he, Tibetan he, he, Buddhism is a little bit rusty at this point. 
Want de Dalai Lama he, he is a gay look. Ja. Yeah. Yeah. De Dalai Lama is, not, is a gay look, but he yeah. is not the head of the gay look sect. He is the Dalai Lama, which is an office. Mm. And uh, it traditionally, it has a dual role of acting as the spiritual head of the Tibetan people or the Tibetan nation, perhaps. And then as its head of state or chief executive of the, the Tibetan government. Uh, so it's an actual office like uh, holding the office of minister in, in, in uh, the British government is an office. Ah, okay. Well, in that case, it doesn't quite let him off the hook so much. That if, so no, yeah. not so, at all. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so the thing is, is, you know, you know, it says in, in your book um, that the Dalai Lama admits that he knew what, uh, what Sogia was up to for about 25 years without publicly denouncing him. And I, and I had assumed because, uh, you know, you have these different sets and perhaps he didn't have the authority within the Nyingma lineage, lineage to, to do that. But as you're, you're saying, he's, he's actually the spiritual leader of the entire Tibetan people. So, yeah, um, I mean, he yeah. has no authority, but he has very considerable influence. Yeah. And if he had chosen to use his influence in order to um, discipline um, certain lamas like Sogel and others, he, Sogel was not the only one by any means. Um, in fact, the Tibetan lamas who didn't sleep with their Western students, I think, were in a minority. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, and the Dalai but Lama could, he, could uh, oh sorry, go on Mary. Go he on. refused, point blank, ever to criticize any other Lama um, on the basis that um, if he did that, he would be breaking a fundamental law of Omerta, which was absolutely hardwired into the Tibetan social order is that you never criticize a Lama. Yeah. And, also, the Dalai Lama could have accomplished so much by doing nothing, by not endorsing people he knows yeah. to be abusive, That's right. not write letters of introduction to their books, not visit their centers. You yeah. know, if only he had done nothing, so much uh, misery could have been prevented um, because people, he did give people the sense I'm seeing this guy, so surely this guy must be okay. I'm endorsing him with my letter of introduction, with my visit to the center, etc. So this guy must be okay. And the Dalai Lama can't absolve himself of that by saying, well, I'm not the formal head of the, uh, the Tibetan tradition or of any Tibetan tradition, and there's not so much I can do. Uh, I don't buy into that at all. Nor do I. Uh, by the way, I can give you a little scoop, if you like. Yeah. That's a, an anecdote. Uh, so when the Dalai Lama was about to visit the Netherlands, um, I was approached by a Dutch victim of a Tibetan Lama in Switzerland uh, who abused her. And she told me, I want to see the Dalai Lama. He's coming to the Netherlands, isn't he? And I said, well, yeah, but it's not so easy to get a, a meeting with him, you know, on such short notice. This was a week before he was due to arrive. So let me think about a way to, to accomplish this. And then together with a, a, a small group of victims, we put together a petition and we involved media and finally they got the meeting. Um, and I was present uh, and I, I was bet to, I was, my role was to act as a liaison with the media and also to give them a bit of moral support. And the Tibetans wouldn't let me in the room, supposedly because I'm a journalist, but probably because they think I'm too, too uh, assertive in, in some ways. So I wasn't in the room, but I saw those victims right before and right after that meeting. And I basically debriefed them. Then the next day, the Dalai Lama was due in Amsterdam and uh, there was a, a, a certain conference there. And right after that, there was a press conference. 
Now, I, I was admitted to the uh, conference uh, because I'm a holder of a press card, so they couldn't refuse me, but I knew I wouldn't get the opportunity to get a question in for the same reason. I have a reputation and people don't want me to ask questions. So our national news network didn't know what to ask. So they approached me and say, well, what should we ask? And then I told them, ask the Dalai Lama, you met with those victims, what did you learn? And they did, so they did ask this question. And then the Dalai Lama said, well, nothing really, because I already knew, which is wow. not the best way <laughs> of I mean, that's presenting your, your track record. I would add to that, that um, that was a PR blunder of monumental proportions, yeah. um, because to actually admit that he knew um, may, I think he was unbelievably naive saying that. Um, yeah, but he was, that, yeah, but he was, was being was honest. the eight signatory letter, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, this was in 2018. So this was after Soviel oh. had stepped down. Uh, okay. And after the Dalai Lama had said, uh, you know, to do some teaching. Disgrace, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but the Dalai Lama was being honest because he, he admitted as much. Uh, he, he actually said that he knew, and we know from other sources, it's highly corroborated that he knew. Mm. Uh, and yet he continued to endorse and support Sogyal and also accept Sogyal's support of him, which is, of course, the other side of things. Mm. It's not just, it was not a one-way traffic. The Dalai Lama actually benefited from Sogyal's support. So yeah, one of the things you, you pointed out in your book is that Sogyal uh, generated an enormous amount of money um, that, yeah. that he actually did you know, pump back into the Tibetan Buddhist world. Um, so, you know, in a sense, he, he, he was, that, that can really cloud people's judgment. Can't, yeah, can't. yeah, yeah. And in, in a sense, he started out as an impresario of other Buddhist teachers when he was very young. He was hosting them, he was inviting them. And later in life, when he got his own position and his own um, power and his own money, he began doing that again. Uh, he acted as the impresario of teachers who came to the center to teach his students. Uh, again, I think part of that was out of necessity because Sovio himself had so little to teach. So he basically needed teachers to teach his students. Um, and of course, it's a, a means of uh, exerting influence and, you know, uh, um, uh, strengthening your own position, so to speak. Uh, and I actually believe that all of those lamas must have known that he was a charlatan, you know, that he was little more than an impresario. Uh, and I see all of them as uh, his enablers. Um, so. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if they knew everything there was to know about the abuse, but they must have heard things, rumors, uh, people mu must have approached them with their concerns and all of that. So the Dalai Lama was by no means alone in enabling Sogyal. No, this is true. I mean, Mimi Duron tells us a, a, a tale that when she realized um, that she was being exploited and that she was actually very unhappy with her situation. Zigar Kontru Rinpoche came to Lera Bling, Sogel's centre in the south of France, um, and was teaching there. And one day Mimi happened to be in the courtyard at the same time as he was, and they were alone. There was nobody else around. And so Mimi went up to Zigar and said, um, is it wrong um, to be a consort? And Zigar looked at her with utter disdain and said, you should know that being the consort of a great Lama like Sogyal is an incredible honor and you should be very grateful. 
Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I Mia was in tears. She was crying. Yeah. Wow. Um, and the amazing thing is, is that I know us having this conversation is really going to annoy you know some people will listen to this and some sacred cows have definitely been trampled on here and um and i think <laughs> you um you've been very brave uh to, to to write this book and and speak out in this way um and i imagine it's it's come at some personal cost to you both in terms of um perhaps your reputation um you know within the within the buddhist community and uh friends mm -hmm. who just don't want to hear what you're saying and and that kind of thing mm -hmm. well yeah but you know it's we both are in a position to fulfill this role because we're not in any way dependent on the communities that we uh, write about uh few people can actually hurt us beyond calling us names, vilifying us, demonizing us on, on the internet and so on. Um, so I, I think it's thanks to our independence that we can actually do this without fearing repercussions. Um, but, you know, it's also uh, has to do with your own um, metaphysical beliefs or lack thereof. Uh, people can't threaten me with met metaphysical stuff because I don't believe in it yeah, at all. Oh, we, I never we should, did. We should definitely touch on this subject because it's an important one. Because this 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 yeah. happens this happens across the board in uh, these different yeah. scenarios, whether you yeah. know um, with any guru that you get threatened yeah. with, literally you know hell. That if you if you question yeah. this stuff, the bad for hell. Yeah, you, yeah. You, yeah. you insult you insult yeah. a teacher, you insult a tradition. You are going to hell. Yeah. And if you, yeah. well, really believe that, that's that's an, a terrible hold to have over a person because it you know. I you, absolutely, like Rob, it's washed off the duck's back for me. I have. I, I mean, I know that some girl commissioned. Penor Rinpoche, known as Paymor Rinpoche, um, to do a whole series of black pujas to try and deal with me. This was before um, Rob and I got together and teamed up and wrote the book. Um, and we'd been working independently on parallel lines, really, for quite some time. And I know that they did the black pujas, but I'm yeah. absolutely convinced that yeah. the only reason a black puja would work was because somebody thought it was going to work, but they believed that it would yeah. work. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't. I always thought it was a bit of a sort of, you know, a shit show. A, 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 a really, I mean, I just would not take it seriously. And but, yeah, just, just to be clear, I'm not afraid of that stuff. But that doesn't mean that people didn't threaten me with that. And they didn't know I don't believe in that stuff. So it was actually meant to, to you know, intimidate me. Now, I, I know quite a few people who actually believe in this. And it does have a terrible hold on their lives. You know, they can have trouble until their very deaths in dealing with the idea that they might be going to some hell or that some some samaya will will cause them endless woes um it's just that i'm not very sensitive to that kind of thing uh, which is fortunate in you know uh, doing what i do um but very recently you know i i've been very critical uh, of the dalai lama um and actually i just got started on that because there's much more where the first stuff came from. I will continue to work on this because I think it's really necessary to be critical of the Dalai Lama. But already, uh, you know, I'm threatened uh, uh, over that and demonized and vilified. And I'm sure at some point death threats will follow. Um, I just happen to be, you know, I'm not very courageous. I, I, I just don't have that fear. You know, you're courageous if you have that fear and do it nonetheless. But I don't have the fear. 
So, you know, it's, it's a normal thing for me to, to deal with this stuff without being afraid. Good for you too, uh, that you uh, feel so impervious to this stuff. But let's say, yeah. well, we know that there are many, many people who are, you know, very superstitious, um, you know, from, from, from students who get into this stuff. And they would really worry about, say, um, you know, if, if they don't perform well in the group or they start to question it, they get threatened with hell or, um, you know, something like that. Well, they get threatened what, with exclusion. Being yeah. So out. what, you know, what would you say? So, uh, you know, you, you, you two, it's like uh, makes you think of the Zen saying a mosquito trying to bite an iron bull in your case but someone who's more vulnerable and susceptible to fear and panic with those kind of threats get, getting into their perspective you know what can you say to somebody who is actually genuinely afraid of going to hell or something i i i, I would counsel them if if you know uh, a a doctrine like Samaya, which is the bond between the guru and his uh, uh, follower, uh, ask yourself, what are those doctrines for actually? You know, are they for developing your mind and becoming more um, stable? Or are they for fearing you into submission? you know, and to look at it that way. Um, now, perhaps if you have already started to believe those things, um, maybe that's too hard for you to look at it that way. Um, um, I got the question just the other day by someone who actually believes that she might go to hell for being critical. Uh, and I was thinking about that and I said, well, the only thing I have to offer her really is the idea that hells don't even exist. They never did. So, but that's, that's just the poverty of my repertoire yeah. speaking because, <laughs> so, you I know- mean, hell is Hell is um, a, a mental state, as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, but not yeah. been in hell. Yeah, but, and um, there are times when I go to hell even now. Um, yeah, um, yeah. I think but, one, um, I would like to say that um, I think you know this, the, a simple a simple way to look at this is if any person threatens you that you will go to hell for not doing what they say that that is that's uh, you know, we're talking to red flags that should be an yeah. enormous red flag yeah. saying yeah. 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 no, no yeah. decent totally. ethical genuinely spiritual um person would ever make that threat and if anyone ever yeah. makes that yeah. threat to you i think you should say right well uh, i'm not going to be part of this because this is dangerous yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so you know maybe we I, could just keep it as simple as that well yeah. you know the, you, you can't be threatened into enlightenment you know uh, mm. so uh, that's a very basic thing uh, buddhism is not about threatening people into enlightenment it doesn't work like that um, so when someone does tr threaten you probably something's wrong i agree yeah. totally yeah and um it's definitely a red flag because the other red flag is is the one that you brought up i think which is the gaslighting is undermining people's self-confidence and continuously building them up and then pu pushing them down which is something that Sogal did all the time constantly yeah. well you know there's there's this other thing that uh, llamas tend to threaten with uh is that your behavior shortens the Lama's life. Yes. Even, the, yes. even the Dalai Lama has done that with the Tibetans, you know, when, when in the early 70s, the Tibetan exiles weren't exactly behaving as the Dalai Lama would wanted them to, he threatened to, 
to the uh, to the pure realms. In other words, to die, you know, to die on them. Uh, and that was basically a threat, and it was perceived as a threat by the Tibetan people at the time. Uh, so they started praying like crazy, and, and they basically submitted, uh, and, and he pulled his threat and said, okay, I'll, I'll accept your long life prayer now. That's, you know, if you actually have a strong bond with your Lama, imagine a father of a mother threatening a child if you don't do as I say, I will die on you. That's the worst thing, yeah. you know. Um, I now, think I think it's again, it's an example of where you know, you know I'm not a therapist. I don't know how to deal with people who actually believe that. But Buddhism is not meant for threatening you in uh, in into submission. Yeah, I think probably as a sort of final statement on this section, perhaps um, you know it comes back to this thing you're saying just apply the same rules you would to any normal situation in your life to your spiritual yeah. community and teachers and things it's 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 that simple and i think you know if if anyone's listening to this and they think wow you know these these guys are going really heavy on the dalai lama the dalai lama is a political figure uh, or a spiritual leader just like anyone else in anywhere else in the world and you know, you may like, say, Jeremy Corbyn's politics, or you might like Boris Johnson's politics or so, but people criticize public figures openly. Uh, even if you agree with a lot of what they do, you, you, there are still things you'll criticize them about because you want them to be better. Uh, and you want them to hear your criticism and um, represent your views. And people criticize you know the archbishop of canterbury and you know all these other figures that you know and that is how these institutions evolve um and how they adapt and it's actually in their interest to listen to criticism take the advice on board and adapt because you know one of the going back to the original context of us wanting to have this conversation we care very much about tibetan culture Tibetans, Tibetan Buddhism, and we want it to thrive in the West. And um, that's how it's going to do that. And by just kind of sticking the fingers in the ears and going blah, 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 when people try and actually say, uh, give advice on how to succeed in the West, um, you know, that's not, that's not the way to go. Um, well, Mary and I are both practicing Buddhists and we differ on some issues and we can differ vehemently and criticize each other's views vehemently <laughs> without losing any sense that it's you know good and proper to collaborate on stuff and and work on the stuff we we do agree on um and I found that in western I, I've seen quite a bit of uh western Buddhism particularly in the Netherlands, but also outside the Netherlands. So within Buddhist groups, you, you can find a tendency um, that people kind of tacitly assume that everyone should agree with each other and, and cultivate the same view of things, which is ridiculous. You know, uh, Buddhism traditionally has been pluriform to an extreme, you know, uh, many branches of Buddhism don't even recognize each other as Buddhists. Um, and But in the West, you find a bit of a tendency to, to, to view Buddhism as a monolithic entity, which should be seen by everyone in the same way. Uh, and that's just, yeah, that's the death of criticism, actually, I think, that culture. Mm. But it's the death of critical thinking, which can mm. actually produce very positive results and analytical thinking and being able to relate um, with a sort of cool head to the relative world. Yeah. An awful lot of people who get stuck into doing Vajrayana practice, for yeah. example, tend to get well, lost. Well, may, maybe I should share an anecdote about my, my first years in the Tibetan yeah. Buddhist center. Uh, so, you know, I've always remained the same. So there's no spiritual development in me whatsoever. You know, I'm basically the same guy as I was like at 18. Uh, and I've also always been very questioning and very curious and, you know, very probing in, in my questions. 
So when I ended up in a, a, a Buddhist center in the Netherlands, uh, there was a, a new Tibetan teacher there, a, a proper Geshe, highly qualified. And he used to encourage people to, to ask questions. And so I did. Uh, and I was really uh, probing and, you know, uh, very determined in questioning him. And he didn't mind, but the students did. So at, after a while, they would try to talk to me afterwards. And people would say, well, you know, uh, if you meditate more, the answers will arrive by themselves or, you know, stuff like that. And that I, I actually, it got to a point where I went to see that teacher privately to ask him if he was bothered by my questions. He said, no, not at all, you know, uh, go on. Um, um, and I wasn't discouraged by those people. Uh, I didn't shut up because I'm not afraid of, of people anyway. So. Uh, I, I, but I know many others who are intimidated by other students and who, you know, hold their tongue and are silent. And the very weird thing was that um, after two or three years, I, I basically got fed up with that culture in that center. So I left, but I used to visit them, you know, for sentimental reasons every now and then. So it, it happened that, uh, you know, I came back like five years later or 10 years later, and then people would come to me and say, ah, I remember you. You asked all these great questions. You know, and but at the time, they weren't happy about it at all. Yeah, yeah. So that kind of climate is, is you know, is, is not conducive to, again, a critical reception. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think what Ralph mentioned earlier on about warning signs, things that people should look out for, both positive and negative, is actually quite worth a little bit of exploration. I don't know if you agree with yeah, me there, Ralph. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we could do that before we get into uh, the sort of specifics of, of um, Sogil and the Rigpa organisation, perhaps. We're sort of you know, starting off with a wider lens and just focusing it as we go on, if you know. Okay. I mean. yeah? yeah. Does that, that sound good? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah I you, think you, the you go thing, for it, Mary. most important thing is to distinguish between a, 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 an effective group and a cult mentality. Um, and the cultishness that has crept in to Buddhist groups of various stripes, not just Tibetan, and I think certainly in some Hindu and yoga ones as well, um, is, you know, that um, everybody, as Rob was saying, has to think the same. We all have to toe the party line. We all have to be very obsequious towards the teacher. Um, and we all have to shuffle and bow and do all of that sort of stuff as if we were actually medieval peasants. Um, and here we are, you know, in the um, 21st century, um, still grappling with our own ideas about what liberal values are and how they should be presented, and um, with them being under threat. Um, and yet, somehow or other, people seem to be blindsided by devotion. And I would say, if anybody's going into this as a newbie, the first thing they need to find out is um, what level of devotional acceptance of the teacher is infallible is present in the group. And if that is there, then I would be very wary. Yeah. yeah. They're not infallible. They're people. They're human. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, and there, there are the, the usual hallmark of cults or cultish uh, groups, uh, but you know, I've always noticed that in many Dharma centers in the West, the turnover is very, very high. Now, you will always have people who just visit one or two times just because they're curious and then they move on to other things. But if there's a high turnover of people who have shown some commitment and some, some serious uh, approach uh, uh, during their stay, 
and they keep disappearing, you really ought to uh, go after them and ask them why they left, uh, you know, and, and do like an exit interview with them or so. Uh, because that's usually a sign that there's, uh, you know, a tendency to act as one group and speak as one group and think as one group. Um, so, so uh, but many, many things are just common sense. And, you know, wh when people, I often speak to people who have been abused, who have been witnesses to abuse, and I tell them basic things like, don't let a llama do what you don't let your plumber do, you know, uh, because uh, that's a sure sign that something's wrong. Um, so, uh, and I often got the sense, and again, not everyone is like that, but people leave their common sense at the door. Uh, yeah. So they, you know, they fall into stuff that they would never fall uh, into, uh, you know, on their football club or whatever, uh, other, other community. Um, so, so I think I, I, I exercise think your common sense, sense, sense first. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think related to what you said, Rob, and what Mary said is a lot of people that are drawn to um, spiritual practice from the East are people who are very unhappy with the West and, you know, mo modern life, secularism, industrialization, um, you know, all, consumerism. All, yeah, consumerism. They're sort of some of the worst aspects that, you know, we would all probably agree on uh, of, of our culture. They kind of pit that against the best aspects of some of these um, pre modern cultures. And there's, you know, sort of romanticization of tribes and ancient ways of living. And, um, and the problem with that, and I mean, that's understandable. And I, I was very, very much um, like that. I went uh, to the School of Oriental and African Studies in London to do a degree there and, you know, ended up hating everything to do with the West and loving anything from tibet central asia shamanic cultures ancient india all of yeah. that stuff i wanted to be able to click my fingers and be living in a, a cave in 11th century tibet you know just um and just vanish from the modern world but then you know as t the years have gone on um i've actually come to appreciate some of the unique contributions of the west uh, for example you know the very rich and diverse study of psychology for example and um, yeah. you know all of the stuff that's been done uh, since the 1970s with feminism and all of that stuff you know these are great contributions and um, to realize that people that come from these um, you know exotic cultures um, and, and tribes and, and this pre-modern world are just people like us and their societies have good strong points and weak points and you know it's all up for discussion uh that you know there shouldn't be any sacred cows um you know we and uh i, I think that plays into it if, if you know what i mean yeah well uh, two things um you said that you know many people who enter spiritual communities uh have their own experiences and frustrations and and uh, you know are seekers in some sense now of course the in particular the charlatans who are waiting for them know this uh, and they know how to exploit it actually it's a self-selective mechanism um so you know that that's a factor that's very important i think uh, another thing that I've noticed, uh, and I'm speaking about the Western Buddhist community, that many of the Western teachers who by now have reached the age, you know, are senior citizens, uh, but are highly respected teachers in their own right, were high school or, or college or university dropouts. Uh, and they weren't that familiar with Western culture uh, and the Western history of ideas. 
and yet they tend to put it down, you know, as if Buddhism were superior to all that. But much of the time, they don't even know what they're talking about. They aren't even familiar with, with for instance, uh, the notion of democracy or the notion of the rule of law. It's incredible how naive and even infantile some people can be about those things. Um, so when entering these communities, you kind of have to be aware that they're not all that sophisticated actually. Um, and that, you know, there are very um, naive and, and wrong ideas about the West that are cultivated in those com communities. So, yeah. Um, and maybe I should add that, you know, I, I, I uh, studied law, so I, I'm a master of law which gave me a solid background, especially uh, in, you know, uh, uh, democracy, rule of law, that kind of thing. Uh, but I've been amazed by the, um, the naive ideas that people can have about those things. Um, yeah, well, yeah. as a journalist, I've had very similar points of view. I mean, <laughs> when I was working um, on the news desk at um, what used to be LBC IRN, um, in other words, it was LBC with independent radio news as the news wing that put the news out to the entire commercial network. It was a pretty responsible job, actually. It was very, very hard line news journalism. Um, I was seen by those people as being the most unbelievably flaky, spiritual, sort of airy fairy, um, new agey type of snowflake, I think is the word these days. Um, and yet when I was with my Buddhist friends in, in the group and, and, and um, around and about various different centers and things in London, I was seen as a hard nosed journalist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and the twain never really met. Yeah. yeah. But I think that my journalistic experience and my capacity to question, to dig for truth, not be phased by celebrity, um, and to have a completely and totally um, focused view um, of where things were going wrong. Um, where other people would really try to sidestep difficult stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah I, I positive. You know, that was the mantra usually. Oh, we want to be positive. Yes, of course you do. We all do, but yeah. we can't pretend that the negative yeah. doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. I, I brought up issues like good governance, oversight financial transparency, which I think are perfectly normal things. Uh, and, you know, people looked at me as if I were mad, you know, uh, of even bringing it up because I brought it up. Um, so, yeah. So it's just one, one, one topic I just wanted to touch on to wrap this up. And you've been very, very generous with your time. Um, is that it, it all kind of came to a head with Sogil uh, and Rigpa. Um, with I think you're talking about this letter with the eight signatories and then this in commissioning this independent investigation with um, a lawyer called Karen Baxter um, into what's got what Sogul had done and and uh, what had also been done by the inner circle in Rigpa and the um, uh, financial um, uh, you know problems they'd had and all these sort of things and she had, you know, very, very detailed investigations, of the whole thing. And then she'd written uh, her advice um, on what they could do to make the RIGPA a better organisation. And I thought I'd just, I'd just kind of read out some of the highlights from, from that. Okay. Yeah. Um, there were 12 yeah. recommendations, right? 12 were there. Yeah, and I, I haven't I haven't written all of them down, um, but people can yeah, look. Okay. In fact, this is actually on the RIGPA website um, that people yeah. can, can look this up. Um, yeah. Now, I think I might have made this one up um, uh, or remembered it, pieced it in from somewhere else that 
and but I think this is something I believe that uh, teachers should be in regular psychotherapy. Um, no, that that wasn't, wasn't one of the recommendations, but I think this is I've seen it elsewhere, and I and I I actually think this is important um, uh, that that teachers should actually be in in in, in psychotherapy um, because you need you need somebody outside of them uh reflecting their behavior back to them no you need but, supervision just like you do when you're a counselor it's yeah. absolutely true yeah. it, it um, very helpful i would go along with that of course tibetan lamas will never agree to that no they yeah I, they they, they, I do understand that a lot of a lot of eastern spiritual teachers poo poo psychology it's just reinforcing your story and your ego and all of that stuff but uh, you know this this may not this may not be advice necessarily to Tibetan teachers, but if there were other teachers, you know, who were just starting out or gathering a following, well, you know, they might start doing this, and yeah. te uh, students yeah. might actually request this of their teachers. You know, say this is the way yeah. we do things in in the West. We've got this long lineage and tradition of psychotherapy. We think it's important. You know, yeah. um, so well, and yeah, with, and yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, please, Rob. No, I, I wanted to say it's it's very common am among psychiatrists, psychologists, but even among general practitioners to have a peer group uh, uh, which functions as a feedback mechanism, um, uh, a mechanism to deal with phenomena like transference, uh, you know, between uh, a client and a, a therapist. Um, my wife is a general practitioner uh, and she teaches young general practitioners how to become one. And she has her own group doing this kind of thing. So it's a very common, very natural thing to do. So I agree with you completely that that would be uh, important to have. To have uh, but knowing Tibetan lamas as I do, and I, I don't suppose Tibetan Roshis or, or you know, Theravadin Bantis will be, will uh, respond differently. I don't think they'll ever accept that kind of thing. Okay. They might accept a peer group, but um, yes. I don't think that it would be along the same lines as supervision of, of a psychotherapy yeah. practice. For example. Okay. But One thing I wanted to say very clearly is you touched on Karen Baxter's report. And there were a number of things which she listed, which she said Rigpa should put in place moving forward in order to um, clean up that act and recalibrate the organization. And I have to say that virtually none of them are there. There is no independent arbitration for starters, which was the one thing that she said was most important was that there should be an independent arbitrator yeah and you know um, very um, i think you know if you there's a lot of window dressing Rigpa are incredibly skillful at um spinning their propaganda on the website yeah they're very good at it but under the surface of that almost nothing has changed patrick gaffney and dominique seed side who were the two senior enablers who had with Sogel from day one, because yeah, I knew them on day one. Um, they are now the senior figures. They are teachers. They are the gurus. They are at the top of the totem in Rigpa. And they are more responsible than anybody else for what happened with Sogel and how he went absolutely stark, raving mad towards the end yeah. of his life. The wow. notions of grandeur rich in that, that's um, really disheartening there, to hear that I think the culture in rigpa is much the same now as it was forever yeah and it's it's important to note that rigpa is struggling to survive financially, financially speaking um i made a pretty thorough analysis of uh, the financial documents of 14 different RIGPA organizations. And uh, surprising to me was that the revenue uh, and the profits already started falling by 2011, 2012, 
before the story about Sogiel broke big, big um, and they were sustaining colossal losses even then, uh, but the losses is, since uh, COVID started have been catastrophic. Uh, so they lost many hundreds of thousands of euros a year in France and in uh, Ireland. So, um, you know, I, first, be, before talking about anything that might have been changed or improved, let's just see if RIPA as an entity survives these years uh, and has a future at all. Yeah, well, this is true. So it, it, that's very, very discouraging to hear <laughs> still going on the same lines and none of this has been put into effect. And uh, well, so, you know, the, these points are for people to look at in, in other contexts. Uh, you know, it seems like Rigpa's, um, you know, there's no hope there. Um, so the, the other, th some of the other points that we've written down that, that she recommended that there was a board of trustees um, who were not part of the organization. You know, they were independent, not students. No. Um, yeah. And that it was periodically refreshed. Um, you know, so you, yeah. you, um, you, you didn't get these kind of like perverse loyalties and things forming. Um, that they have a sort of professional management um, because I, I, I remember uh, from reading your books, they made some disastrous uh, business decisions, um, you know, that uh, constructing retreat centers and you know, done really poorly and wasted um, enormous amounts of money. And it partly because they weren't, were just students, uh, you know, who weren't experts in that, that field. Um, yeah. Uh, um, that uh, yeah, just 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 three more that I'd written down. That they have a written safeguarding policy and training for staff, just like they do in schools. And uh, they do have that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's window dress. Right. It's just cosmetic. Yeah, and th th there's this other thing. Um, we have a saying in Dutch, basically saying that paper is patient. So, you know, you can put many things down in writing, but without the culture changing, without the mentality changing, it's basically meaningless. Uh, I've, you know, I've investigated abuse in Buddhist communities in the Netherlands, and I have dossiers in, uh, on about uh, 25 individual teachers. Um, and in many instances, those um, uh, communities did have safeguarding policies and you know protocols and 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 um, people uh, you could go to uh, confidentially and and talk confidentially about stuff but without the proper mentality uh, those things are only providing a full sense of security which is actually worse than no security at all because it will basically take away people's common skepticism or you know critical faculties because things they think things are put together in a proper way so um the the one thing that makes all of the difference is is the mentality of the people involved and unless that changes basically the, basically the rest of it is is almost meaningless yeah Wow, this is this is so co this is so complex. Um, so, you know, the, the 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 window dressing, or you know, we see it in other contexts with greenwashing, and um, uh, yeah, you know, uh, in other certain countries, um, washing their unethical behaviors with you know publicity and PR yeah, yeah, yeah. campaigns and all that stuff. So, you know, we we say for anyone listening to this you've got to be wise to that too that people can as you say you know make all the right noises but you need to actually see these things yeah. genuinely happening so you know you're yeah. saying in, in in the case of rigpa uh, these are not being put into place but people 
in other contexts can keep an eye out for these as, as uh, or even oh, definitely because, but you know uh, yeah uh, but all of those recommendations are good recommendations don't don't uh, yeah. get me wrong it's just you know there there's the practical matter that the heart you know the the core of any community um, in the west tends to be very small so the demographics of the Buddhist community in the West is not exactly uh, promising because the communities are aging. So you have less and less people who, to do all the work. So to have these people functioning independently of each other and provide oversight to each other, you need enough people. And very often they, are, they just aren't there, you know? So, it will be a tiny community and the, the group that is fully committed and is available full time or, or even half time is even smaller. So, you know, to, to have all these um, um, positions occupied by, by committed people and then have them rotate is quite hard to, uh, yeah. to uh, realize. That's a tall, it's a tall order. And I, yeah. Yeah, we, we had the, that problem in the Netherlands. A problem, the Netherlands is a country that is small enough to have an umbrella organization that can provide that function to all of the different communities who can actually uh, have, uh, have it themselves. But then you get into uh, all kinds of turf wars and Zen people will not listen to someone who's doing the oversight if he's from a Tibetan, because they think that, you know, Tibetan Buddhists can't possibly understand what's going on in Zen and vice versa. So it's it's very hard to, to put together, <laughs> but it, it is a good idea. It's important, but the community is being so small, it's very, very hard to, yeah. um, to have yeah. it done. Yeah, so these, these are sort mm -hmm. of like North stars that we can all be, you know, moving towards and uh, perfecting an imperfect situation. Um, but, you know, they, these are all these practical points you're raising are, are also very important and uh, people should, should look out. Yeah, for but the, the recommendation should the recommendation should remind you of what's important and of what kinds of oversight are imaginable. Yeah. And just thinking in those terms will kind of help you be more realistic about yourself and the community that you're part of. Um, so, you know, they are very important uh, signposts or, or, or uh, reminders of the things that are important. Yeah. We've got two more and then we can wrap it up. Um, okay. So one was uh, an external helpline for abuse that has nothing to do with... Yeah. Um, that organization Nothing. yeah no, uh, yeah well we we actually had that in the netherlands so that was completely independent and anyone co could call uh but then uh again buddhist communities started to have their own thing because they said well those people who are uh, on that line they don't actually know our tradition so well and stuff like that so again you would get those turf wars. We, we did have one line and they did get many uh, reports and complaints. And I think it was a good thing to have and it's an important thing to have. Buddhists can be so obnoxious, you know, it's yeah. very hard to get them to learn actually. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the last one is, is uh, to make sure all fundraising uh, is, is, is legal um and and applied correctly and to be transparent about fundraising because you know if you if people are just giving money and not asking where it's going uh you know it's just we do the same with our taxes paying our taxes in a country the government are under enormous scrutiny and um you know we've all got our opinions about where the money's been spent but you can't just yeah. give money willy-nilly to um uh, teachers, spiritual teachers and organizations just think that they're going to use it well. Uh, they need to be accountable. Well, there, there, yeah. There's the power of the purse, you know, when, you know, to you, 
you can make your donations contingent on proper behavior, proper mechanisms, you know? Um, so you should be aware that, you know, as you say, don't give your money willy nilly without even checking how it's spent, you yeah. know? Um, but and you don't, you don't yeah. do that in any other context. So you shouldn't do it here, you know? And it's just, again, it's a- it's No, just no, a exactly, context. exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, so, people tend yeah. to you, people tend to spend much more time and devote much more care to their new car or their next holiday because it costs a lot, and they want to be sure that they spend the money well. But you know, with donations to Buddhist centers, they just give and never bother to check what happens to it. Yeah, and and that needs to change. It's important. Yeah, definitely. Wow, so we've gone so deep into this. I, I so appreciate your time uh, and all the work you've done on this. And uh, it's been a very thorough exp exploration of it. And I really, really hope uh, people listen to this and benefit from this and we can create a more healthy culture, uh, you know, with, with spiritual communities and practitioners and teachers. You know, we, we're all co-creating this together. Um, and um, this is our mission definitely yeah. there's no question yeah i can now, say you, then, I, I can see you guys yeah. are on a mission yeah it is a mission yes. <laughs> well when when people you know after listening have more questions or or perhaps criticisms they're they're free yeah. to approach us and you know uh very happy to talk. Uh, we're very happy to to respond to any question they might have um or you know when uh, because this happens to me quite often when people who have been abused want to uh, approach uh, me for instance uh, I'm very happy to put them in touch with people who can help in some way or can report on uh, whatever is happening uh, so uh, let's not make this conversation the end of it yeah so so people can contact you Rob via the open Buddhism website is that correct yeah, they can. And, you know, I, I need to be clear. I've stopped doing the actual reporting on abuse myself, but I have a, a strong network of uh, colleagues, journalists, and, and some people, uh, in, you know, who some, some contacts uh, in the world of th therapy uh, and even legal uh, stuff. Um, so I can help people to get in touch with the right people, um, but they shouldn't approach me with the expectation that I will report their story because I've stopped doing that. I'm, I, I'm still writing about these things, but not the day-to-day -day reporting on abuse cases. Yeah, okay. And, and Mary... Well, I'm pretty well retired. Yeah, you're um, retired. But I, I, I am retired, yes, but... Um, I, if people approach me, if they find me, if they Google me, which is very easy to find me, and people do, and if they do, I give them whatever it is I hope that will be helpful for them. Yeah. But I don't put myself out there anymore. Yeah. And I don't participate in discussion forums either. No. And, and of course, you both have written the book, which I'll link to in the show notes. Um, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a really, really great book. And I'll just say again, uh, for those listening, it's called Sex and Violence in Tibetan Buddhism, The Rise and Fall of Sogya Rinpoche by Mary Finnegan and uh, Rob Hogendorn. I made all the music that I use in my podcasts. If you'd like to hear more of my music, please visit SoundCloud and check out my profile, Ralph Crew.